The Bible Treasury, New Series. N5. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 25, Article 11. Part 1 1904 and 1905. Positive Testimony to the Pentateuch. Alexander M. Call D.D. Objections do not destroy the historic character of the Pentateuch. But it is well to remember, that, independently of all solutions of difficulties, there is testimony sufficient to prove its genuineness and divine origin. That testimony is found in the books of the Old and New Testament. It is possible to trace the existence of the Pentateuch in every age, from Malachi to Joshua, that is sufficient to prove its genuineness. It has the sanction of the Savior and his apostles, and that will prove its divine origin. The question may, however, occur to some minds, how do we know that the Pentateuch, which we now possess, is that referred to by our Lord, and cited by Hebrew writers? To this, the answer is, we have the most satisfactory proof of the identity. The Pentateuch has descended to us in at least four independent channels. The whole people of the Jews, Rabbinists, and Karaites, the Greek, Syrian, and Roman churches, all possess a Pentateuch. It stands at the beginning of their sacred scriptures. And those different copies, the Hebrew, Chaldee, Greek, Syriac, and Latin, all so wonderfully agree, as to leave no doubt of identity. The present Jews have received their Hebrew copies, and the Chaldee translations, from those who dwelt not only in Jerusalem but in Babylon. The Pentateuch of Eastern, and Western, Indian, African, and Chinese Jews is the same. The translation possessed by the Greeks is that received at the time of their conversion and has come down in a perfectly distinct channel from the Hebrew. There was no love between Jews and Greeks, so as to induce the latter to conform their scriptures to those of the former, and yet the Greek Pentateuch is manifestly a translation of the Hebrew possessed by the Jews. The Syriac version agrees still more minutely with the Hebrew, and yet the intercourse of Syrian Christians with Jews was as little as that of the Greeks. With regard to the Latin, there is the same agreement and the same independence of transmission. Between Jews and Christians, there was a wall of separation which entirely prevented either from the borrowing of the other. Amongst Christians themselves, there were differences, both in language and theology, sufficient to prevent collusion. The Greek translation was not made from the Syriac, nor the Syriac from the Greek. They are entirely independent one of the other, and yet all present to us, with a few unimportant differences, the same Pentateuch. The Hebrew is that which the Jews received from their fathers. The Greek existed before the incarnation of the Savior. The Syriac version was made, as is generally supposed, early in the second century, probably before that time. We have, therefore, four independent witnesses to prove the identity of the Pentateuch which we possess, with that which was known to our Lord. And to these might be added the testimonies of Philo and Josephus, in whose writings sufficient portions of the Pentateuch are found to prove the identity of their copies with ours, and their belief that Moses was the author. But, from the days of our Lord to the time of the last canonical Hebrew writer, there is a long interval. How can it be known, therefore, that the Pentateuch as then existing was that received from Malachi and his contemporaries? Here again, there is a chain of sufficient testimonies. About 130 years before Christ, the grandson of Jesus, the son of Sirach, translated the book of Ecclesiasticus into Greek. See note. That book is acknowledged to be genuine and has so many references to the law as to prove the identity of the book so called. The first book of Maccabees, also received as authentic by modern critics, carries us nearly 50 years farther back. The mad efforts of Antiochus Epiphanes to destroy the Book of the Law, and the zeal, not only of the priests, but of the common people, ready to die rather than disobey it, attest the existence of the Book, and the popular belief that it was from God. That our Pentateuch existed and was received as the Law of Moses, 100 years earlier,
that is about 280 years before Christ is attested by the fact that it was then translated into Greek by Alexandrian Jews. Their version, commonly known as Septuagint, is that quoted by evangelists and apostles, and handed down to us by the Greek fathers, and of whose agreement with the Hebrew, we have already spoken. Note. See Hodi, De Bibliorum Textibus Originalibus pages 192 and 193, John's Introduction, Part 2 249, De Wet, Einleitung, Bleak, etc. End of note. Nor is this by any means all. The providence of God has preserved a still more ancient testimony, in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Its existence was known to the Christian fathers, but for a thousand years it lay concealed, and at last came forth as from the grave, to assure us of the identity of the Pentateuch. Suppose that in that long interval some doubter had said, the Samaritans were a distinct and rival sect, hated by the Jews, and hating in return. Josephus, and the fathers of the church, and the rabbis, all bear witness that they had a copy of the Pentateuch, bring it forth and let us compare it with the Hebrew and Christian copies, and see whether they agree. How would he have triumphed had the Samaritan copy been produced, and found to differ altogether from those of Jews and Christians? But what is the fact? The Samaritan copy has been produced, written in a character equally unknown to Jews and Christians. A little remnant of the people still exists to present it to the world. And lo! With the exception of a very few passages, it is the same in narrative and legislative enactment as that known to the synagogue and the church. This testimony carries us back to the erection of the temple on Mount Gerizim, to the days of Sanballat, that is, to the time of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 13 verse 28, and the close of the canon of the Old Testament, and assures us not only that it existed, but that it was not and could not be a compilation of those times. Manasseh, of the family of the high priest, being excluded from the priesthood because he refused to dismiss his heathen wife as the law required, does not protest against this law as ungenuine, and therefore unworthy of obedience but, when he leaves the Jewish people, imposes its yoke upon his Samaritan friends. Such conduct can only be explained by Manasseh's firm conviction that its origin was divine. Its acceptance by the Samaritans testifies a similar conviction on their part, produced by what they had already learned. At all events, the Pentateuch then existed, was ever afterwards preserved by the Samaritans. And their copy now shows the identity of their Pentateuch with our own. See note. Note. I have here followed Prito, Volume 1, page 396, etc., in his view of the history of Sanballat, and the Samaritan adoption of the Pentateuch. Since then a similar view has been defended by Hung Stenberg, Authentic De Pentateuchs, Volume 1, pages 1 to 48, also by Bleak, Einleitung pages 332 to 337. Dr. S. Davidson, in his Treatise on Biblical Criticism, Volume 1, pages 97 and 98, thinks that the Samaritans received the law in the time of Josiah, which is, of course, more favorable to the present argument. Indeed, on page 95, he asserts, that it the Pentateuch was in the kingdom of the ten tribes and obtained legal authority, must be taken as certain. End of note. Ezra, Nehemiah, and the latter prophets. Thus, without having recourse to the sacred records, we have traced the existence of the Pentateuch to the time of the return from Babylon. From this time on we have the testimony of Hebrew writers. Of these, during the rebuilding of the Temple and City of Jerusalem, and the restoration of the Hebrew Commonwealth, there are no less than five, Malachi, Haggai, Zechariah, Nehemiah, and Ezra. With the two last named writers modern criticism has dealt unceremoniously. But the unsparingness of the criticism has done more good than harm. The most skeptical admit enough to be genuine, proving that the law existed, and was received as the law of God given by Moses. These books describe the endeavor of the leaders of the Jews to restore the temple and the worship, as they had been before the captivity, and the law of Moses is the norm according to which all was to be done. Ezra, 7 verse 21, 
speaks of the law of the God of heaven. Nehemiah, 1 verse 7, confesses the transgression of the commandments, statutes, and judgments, which God commanded Moses. Malachi, 4 verse 4, commands Israel to remember the law of Moses given in Horeb, with the statutes, and judgments. Haggai says, Ask now the priests concerning the law. Zechariah testifies against Israel, that they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. Now the law which is here spoken of must be that known to Manasseh and the Samaritans, and therefore identical with that which we now possess. It was evidently not written or compiled at the time. The tithes and sacrifices were burdensome under the circumstances of the returned Jews, the laws with respect to marriage more burdensome still. Nothing but faith in the law, as received from their fathers, could have led the people to submit, or the leaders to persevere in the trying and ungrateful task of restoring the ancient worship and discipline. Indeed, it is admitted on all hands that the law spoken of, or alluded to, in these books, is the Pentateuch in all its completeness as we now possess it. The Jews must, therefore, have possessed it in their exile, and brought it back with them on their return. Ezekiel the correctness of this statement is abundantly proved by the writings of Ezekiel, who was himself a captive. He had been carried away eleven years before the destruction of Jerusalem, began to prophesy in the fifth year of the captivity, and continued to prophesy at least until the sixteenth year after the city had been destroyed. Ezekiel 1 verses 1 and 2, and Ezekiel 29 verse 17. Concerning the genuineness of these writings, modern criticism raises no doubts. Its estimate of Ezekiel's style and genius is not very flattering, but it pronounces that the prominent and unequivocal peculiarities of the man are stamped on every page from the beginning to the end that the book was written, and its parts arranged in their present order by Ezekiel himself. See note. If therefore, he was acquainted with the Pentateuch or law, it must be that which Ezra and his companions brought with them from their exile, even if we had no details to prove their identity. That he was thus acquainted with a law, judgments, and statutes, acknowledged by the people as divine, to which therefore he could refer in order to convince them of sin, and on which, as upon an infallible authority, he could found his reproofs, is certainly beyond the shadow of a doubt. Note. See De Wet, Einleitung, 221-224. Gizanius, Geschicht, page 35. Bleak, Einleitung, page 515. Ullmann, COMM, page 7. Compare Karpzov, Introd. Part 3. Page 205. And John Henry Michaelis' preface to Ezekiel, sect, 14. In Ezekiel 22 verse 26 says, Her priests have done violence to my law that in this passage the prophet does not use the word law, generally, of any religious doctrine given by God, but of the law, is evident from the detail which precedes and follows the words quoted. In verses 7 to 12 we read, In thee have they set light by father and mother, in the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger, in thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised my holy things, and hast profaned my sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood, and in thee they eat upon the mountains, in the midst of thee, they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness, in thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law, and another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood, thou hast taken usury and increase. In these few verses there are at least 29 references to, or rather quotations from, the Pentateuch, from Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, perceptible in the English version, but the very Hebrew words used in the original of those books. See note. In the 26th verse, first referred to, we read, Her priests have done violence to my law, and have profaned my holy things, they have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. 
In this one verse are at least four more references, to Leviticus 10 verse 10, Leviticus 11 verse 45, Leviticus 20 verse 25, and Exodus 31 verse 13. Besides which, it is to be remarked that the word translated profane occurs only in the Pentateuch, in 1 Samuel 21 verse 5 and 6, and in Ezekiel. Let the reader also examine chapters 18 and 20, where he will find references and quotations without end. The latter chapter is also worthy of attention as a recapitulation of the history of what happened in the wilderness. Note. Let the reader turn up the marginal references in any ordinary edition of the Bible. End of note. Indeed the whole book of Ezekiel is impregnated with the language of the Pentateuch, as has been proved long ago. It is especially remarkable for the use of the figures and language peculiar to the Pentateuch. Thus, the phrase, pine away in their iniquity, Ezekiel 4 verse 17, Ezekiel 24 verse 23, Ezekiel 33 verse 10 occurs only here and Leviticus 26 verse 39. Again, a favorite expression of Ezekiel's, mine eyes shall not spare, Ezekiel 5 verse 11, Ezekiel 7 verses 4 and 9, Ezekiel 8 verse 18, Ezekiel 9 verses 5 and 10, occurs in the Pentateuch, once in Genesis 45 verse 20, margin, five times in Deuteronomy, and only once besides in the whole Bible, Isaiah 13 verse 18. Another phrase peculiar to Ezekiel and the Pentateuch is, I will draw out a sword after them. Compare Exodus 15 verse 9, Leviticus 26 verse 33, with Ezekiel 5 verses 2 and 12, Ezekiel 12 verse 14, and observe in Leviticus 26 verse 33, and Ezekiel 12 verse 14 that the threat of drawing the sword is in both cases accompanied with the threat of dispersion, expressed in the original in the very same words. Again, the phrase staff of bread, occurring in our prophet, Ezekiel 4 verse 16, Ezekiel 5 verse 16, Ezekiel 14 verse 12 is found only in the Pentateuch, Leviticus 26 verse 26. In like manner, the expression I will set my face, employed several times by Ezekiel, is, excepting two passages in Jeremiah, found only in the Pentateuch. There are many other similar points of agreement, but these are sufficient to identify the law of which Ezekiel speaks with the Pentateuch which we now possess. And it is particularly to be observed, that his references to the law necessarily imply that the priests, the prophets, and the people all knew the law to which he referred, and received it as an undoubtedly divine authority, to which they were amenable, by which they were to be judged, and from which there was no appeal. We have therefore unexceptionable testimony that the Pentateuch existed in the captivity, and seven years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah the testimony of Ezekiel is overlapped by that of Jeremiah, who was partly his contemporary and partly his predecessor, whose writings also, with a few exceptions to which it is not necessary now to refer, have stood the test of modern criticism. If Jeremiah knew a divine law, it must be that known to Ezekiel, and therefore that known to us. That such a law was known to him is certain. He mentions it expressly and often quotes it. Thus in Jeremiah 9 verse 13, 12, the Lord says, They have forsaken my law which I set before them, and, Jeremiah 16 verse 11, They have not kept my law, and, Jeremiah 6 verse 19, They have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but have rejected it, and again, Jeremiah 32 verse 22, the prophet says, They have not obeyed thy voice, neither walked in thy law. But some will perhaps say, as some have said, that of course the law was known to Jeremiah, as in his days the book of the law is said to have been found in the temple, but that, before this book was found, it was unknown, and therefore fabricated by Hilkiah and his fellow priests, and imposed upon Josiah. The reasoning upon which former skeptics arrived at this conclusion is absurd. They argue thus, a book was found, or pretended to be found, by the priest, who said, I have found the book of the law, which never existed, and of course was unknown to the king and the people. And yet, though utterly unknown, it was instantly received by the king and all the people without suspicion or inquiry, 
and all submitted to the extirpation of the idolatries then practiced, and to the burdens which it imposed, and, according to this unknown book, reformed church and state. And although they had never before heard of its enactments, they believed that it had been observed by their fathers from the days of Moses. This is plainly impossible. That the king and the court, and many of the people, might have been, and probably were, ignorant of the contents of the law, is highly probable. The two preceding reigns had been decidedly hostile to true religion. Manasseh was both a seducer and a persecutor. He seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. He reared up altars for Baal and Asherah, and worshipped all the host of heaven in the courts of the Lord's house, and filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. Ammon, his successor, walked in all the ways that his father walked in, and served the idols that his father served, and these kings were followed by priests, prophets, and people, as we find Jeremiah complaining, the priests said not, Where is the Lord? The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal the house of Israel is ashamed, they, their kings, their princes, their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth, Jeremiah 2 verses 8 and 26. Even of Jerusalem itself, he says, There is not one that seek the truth, verse 1. No wonder, then, that they who are so described permitted the temple to go to ruin, and the copy of the law, belonging to it perhaps the very autograph of Moses, to be lost. No wonder if Josiah, with such a father and grandfather, such priests, and such a court, had been ignorant of the denunciations of the law. Hilkiah, on the contrary, was not astonished. He says, I have found the book of the law. He knew, therefore, that there was such a book, and says, I have found it as Thenius, who is certainly no believer in inspiration, says in his commentary, the expression, the book of the law, shows plainly that the question here is not about something that came to light for the first time, but something that was already known. See note. Note. Comment on 2 Kings 22 verse 8. End of note. It is true that this commentator does not believe that the book found was our present Pentateuch, but he believes that what was found was not something new, or something never heard of before, but a written law, previously known. He believes that such a written law had existed, just as Hitzig asserts, in his commentary on Jeremiah, page 60, that a written law had always existed in Judah. But as the law known to Ezekiel was our present Pentateuch, that known to Jeremiah, partly his contemporary, cannot be different. That it was known to Jeremiah before the finding of the book can be proved by his prophecies delivered at the beginning of his ministry. He began to prophesy in the thirteenth year of Josiah. The book of the law was not found until the eighteenth year of that king. Now even Hitzig admits that Jeremiah 2 verse 1 to 8 verse 17 were written before the eighteenth year, and the second chapter probably in the thirteenth year of Josiah, that is, the first of Jeremiah's ministry. See note. Note. See Hitzig, in LOC compare also Bleak, Einleitung, page 472. End of note. Both testify the existence of the law. In Jeremiah 2 verse 8 it is said, They that handle the law know me not and in Jeremiah 8 verse 8, How say ye, we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us. Before the finding of the book, therefore, the law existed and was called the law of the Lord. These chapters also contain references and quotations which serve to identify it with the present Pentateuch. Thus, Jeremiah 2 verse 6, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country, to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof but when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Here are allusions, either in sense or word or both, to Deuteronomy 8 verse 15, Numbers 14 verses 7 and 8 Leviticus 18 verses 25 to 28, 
Numbers 35 verses 33 and 34. In verse 28 the prophet says, Where are thy gods, that thou hast made thee? Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of trouble, evidently a quotation of Deuteronomy 32 verses 37 and 38. Jeremiah 3 verse 1 is an undoubted reference to Deuteronomy 24 verses 3 and 4. Jeremiah 3 verse 16 refers to a number of places in the Pentateuch, and the chief features in the Mosaic worship, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. This tells us that there was a covenant, Exodus 24 verses 7 and 8, Deuteronomy 5 verses 2 and 3, that there was an Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the very words found in Numbers 10 verse 33, and Deuteronomy 31 verse 26, that the Israelites used to visit it words to be explained only by the commands, to go up three times in the year, Exodus 23 verse 17, Deuteronomy 16 verse 16. In the days of Jeremiah, before the finding of the book, Therefore, the whole history of the covenant, that is in fact, of the giving of the law, all the directions about the ark, the three great feasts, is presupposed, and without the existence of the Pentateuch would be unintelligible. Jeremiah 4 verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, is a quotation from Deuteronomy 10 verse 16, and an allusion to Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, and contains a figure found in no other sacred writer. Jeremiah 5 verse 15, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say, is a quotation from Deuteronomy 28 verse 49, and Jeremiah 5 verse 17, They shall eat up their harvest, etc., from Leviticus 26 verse 16, and Deuteronomy 28 verse 31. Again, in Jeremiah 7 verse 6, Oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, are unmistakable allusions to Exodus 22 verse 21, Deuteronomy 19 verse 10, Deuteronomy 6 verses 14 and 15, Deuteronomy 4 verse 10, Genesis 15 verse 18, Genesis 17 verse 8, Genesis 26 verse 3 etc. The prophecies were written subsequently to the finding of the book also contain numerous undoubted allusions to, or quotations from, the Pentateuch. But those written before that time prove abundantly that Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, was well acquainted with the letter and the spirit of that law, which we now know as the Pentateuch. There can, therefore, be no doubt, that the law of which he speaks as the law of the Lord, existing at the same time as that known to Ezekiel, must be identical with it, and also with the book of the law found in the temple. And thus the existence of the Pentateuch from the days of our Lord to the thirteenth year of Josiah is firmly established. But it was not then invented nor written for the first time, it was not anything new. Jeremiah had known it from his youth, for he was called at an early age. The people knew of it as well as the prophet, and therefore it could not have been invented any very short time preceding that in which Jeremiah began to prophesy. Neither could it have been invented in the days of Ammon or Manasseh. Theirs were not days for trying to introduce a new religious system of laws, of which the great object was to extirpate idolatry. And therefore we must pursue our inquiry to the time of Hezekiah, Isaiah, Micah, Amos, Hosea. As the book of the law existed at the beginning of Josiah's reign, and could not have been forged in the days of Ammon or Manasseh, it must have existed in the time of Hezekiah. But it is not necessary to depend on inference in this matter. There are four unimpeachable witnesses of the fact, the prophets Isaiah, Micah, Amos, Hosea, who bring us back beyond the days of Hezekiah to those of Uzziah and Jeroboam II. Three of these expressly mention the law of the Lord to testify that it was written in a book. All cite the contents of that book sufficiently to identify it with that which we possess. Thus, in Isaiah 5 verse 24 we read, They have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and again, 
Isaiah 30 verse 9 children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Amos says, Amos 2 verse 4, they have despised the law of the Lord, Hosea 4 verse 6, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God I will also forget thy children, and again, Hosea 8 verse 1, they have transgressed my covenant, and trespassed against my law. These passages assuredly prove without just doubt that there was a law well known to the people, acknowledged as the law of God, which it was a sin to transgress, and, as appears from the last passage, obligatory in the nature of a covenant. The title, also, appears to have been in these days, the law of the Lord, as in Jeremiah 8 verse 8. That it was written is testified by Hosea 8 verse 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. And therefore Isaiah speaks of it as the book, just as we speak of the Bible. In Isaiah 29 verse 18, it is said, In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, which even Gazinius interprets of the law. His commentary on this verse is worth transcribing. The deaf and the blind are the hardened and blinded free thinkers, mentioned verse 9, who shall then leave the darkness in which they had been sitting, and turn to the light of the law, compare Isaiah 2 verse 5. Sefer, the book, by preeminence, is the book of the law, like the roll of the book, Psalm 40 verse 8, and books, Daniel 9 verse 2, the Holy Scriptures. The Arabs also use the expression, the book, preeminently of the Quran, though sometimes of the Holy Scripture of the Jews and Christians. Only one book of the law could have been called the book, and, therefore, this book, mentioned by Isaiah as so well known as to require no further description, must be identical with the book of the law found in the time of Josiah. But, as we have shown that this book was our present Pentateuch, it follows that the Pentateuch existed in the days of Hezekiah, indeed, the words of Hosea 8 verse 12 show that it was known in the days of Uzziah and Jeroboam II. Even if these prophets had quoted nothing from the book, the identity stands fast, but they have references amply sufficient to satisfy all impartial minds, that they were well acquainted with the Pentateuch as known to us. In the first place, it is plain that they are acquainted with the history. They know of the sin of Adam. Like Adam, see note 1, they have transgressed the covenant, Hosea 6 verse 7 they know of the sentence on the serpent, see note 2, they shall lick the dust like the serpent, they shall move out of their holes like creeping things of the earth, Micah 7 verse 17. But we have here, not only a reference to Genesis 3 verse 14, but a quotation of certain words found Deuteronomy 32 verse 24. The Hebrew word for creeping things occurs only here, in Deuteronomy and in Job 32 verse 6. The references to Sodom and Gomorrah are frequent, Isaiah 1 verses 9 and 10, Isaiah 3 verse 9, Amos 4 verse 11, and Hosea 11 verse 8. The promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are also referred to, Micah 7 verse 20. Hosea refers to the history of Jacob. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength, he had power with God, yeah, he had power over the angel and prevailed, he wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. Here are three allusions, to Genesis 25 verse 26, Genesis 32 verse 24, and Genesis 28 verse 11. Note 1. Not, like men, but like Adam, as in Job 31 verse 33. Adam actually did both things imputed to him in these passages. Hitzig, comment. In LOC. End of note 1. Note 2. Here also Hitzig acknowledges the reference to Genesis 3 verse 14. End of note 2. The bringing up out of Egypt, and the wandering in the wilderness, are spoken of in the very language of the Pentateuch, as Micah 6 verse 4. I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Compare 7 verse 15. Hosea, 2 verse 15, says, She shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of Egypt, referring both to Exodus, and to the song of Moses and Miriam, then again 11 verse 1, When Israel was a child, 
Then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt alluding particularly to the language of Exodus 4, 22 and 23, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, and I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. Amos, 2 verse 10, says, Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and led you forty years through the wilderness, to possess the land of the Amorite. Besides the Exodus, and the sojourn in the wilderness there is also a reference to Genesis 15 verse 16. Compare also Amos 3 verse 1, and 5 verse 25. Micah, 6 verse 5, refers to the history of Balaam. These prophets also show an accurate acquaintance with particular precepts. Thus, when Isaiah says, Isaiah 1, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he-goats, in the original, the names of the animals are all masculine, because, according to the Mosaic law, the males alone were lawful for burnt offerings. In the next verse, when ye come to appear before me, he uses the language of Exodus 34 verse 24, respecting the three great feasts. In the thirteenth verse, bring no more vain meat offerings, incense is an abomination to me, the new moons and sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn day of assembly. Isaiah not only refers to several mosaic precepts but shows the same exact knowledge. Thus, he puts meat offering together with incense, because for the former the latter was required. See Leviticus 2 verses 1 and 16, and Leviticus 6 verses 14 and 15. And, next to new moons and sabbaths, he mentions calling of assemblies or holy convocations, because these convocations were held at those times, as well as on the great feasts, see the whole of the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. Along with these holy convocations, he speaks of what is translated solemn assembly, but means particularly the seventh day of the feast of the Passover, and the eighth of that of tabernacles. See Leviticus 23 verse 36, Numbers 29 verse 35, Deuteronomy 16 verse 8. Again, in Isaiah 2 verse 7, he complains, their land is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots and in Isaiah 31 verse 1 he pronounces a woe against them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are strong. Without the Pentateuch, it would be difficult to explain the sin of having horses and chariots. Deuteronomy 17 verse 16 tells us, that to have them, or to send down to fetch them, was forbidden by Jehovah. Isaiah 3 verse 14, Ye have eaten up the vineyard, is an allusion to Exodus 22 verse 5, If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his own beast, and shall feed in another man's field, of the best of his own field, and of his own vineyard shall he make restitution. The Hebrew word for eat is peculiar, and the same in both places, so as to leave no doubt of the allusion. The prophet says, Verse 26, He will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss to them from the end of the earth, and, behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. This is a citation from Deuteronomy 28 verse 49, where it is said, The Lord shall lift up a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. At the same time Isaiah shows that he is the later writer by the alteration of the words, he shall lift up a nation, into he shall lift up an ensign. The latter part of the verse in Deuteronomy, a nation, whose language thou shalt not understand, is here omitted by the prophet, but it is referred to elsewhere in Isaiah 28 verse 11, and 33 verse 19. Again in Isaiah 30 verses 16 and 17, there is a verbal citation of two passages of the law, but yes said, no, but we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they be swift that pursue you. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee. Exact parallels are found in Leviticus 26 verse 8, five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and in the threat, verse 17, ye shall flee when none pursueth you.
Compare also Deuteronomy 32 verse 30. The reader will easily find many more. But we must hasten on to the other and the so-called lesser prophets. Hosea, in Hosea 9 verse 3, etc., refers to a number of the Mosaic commandments. They shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings unto the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing to him, their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners, all that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread for their soul shall not come into the house of the Lord. What will ye do in the day of the appointed assembly, and in the day of the feast of the Lord? And again, Hosea 12 verse 9, 10, I will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles, as in the days of the appointed feast, not feasts as in some English Bibles. In like manner, Amos says, Amos 8 verse 10, I will turn your periodical feasts into mourning. The Hebrew word is used especially of the Passover, Exodus 34 verse 25, and of the Feast of Tabernacles, Leviticus 23 verse 34. He uses the same word, Amos 5 verse 1, and couples with it that peculiar word which we have translated above, Day of the Solemn Assembly. The new moons and Sabbaths are also mentioned in Hosea 2 verse 11, 13, and Amos 8 verse 5. In Amos 4 verses 4 and 5, there is one short passage which shows an intimate acquaintance with many of the Levitic laws. It is this, Come to Bethel and transgress, at Gilgal multiply transgression, and bring your sacrifices every morning, and your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free will offerings. Now here is, in the first place, an allusion to the continual burnt offering, Numbers 28, in the second place, to the tithe to be laid up at the end of three years, Deuteronomy 14 verse 28, and 26 verse 13, in the third place, to the thank offering, in which sacrifice alone leavened bread is permitted. In Leviticus 2 verse 11 it is expressly said, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in the offering of the Lord made by fire but with regard to the thanksgiving offering an exception is made. First, it is said, Leviticus 7 verse 12, If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then shall he offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers. But then it is added, Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread, with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. In the fourth place, the prophet speaks of the free will offering, mentioned in Leviticus 22 verses 18 to 21, and Deuteronomy 12 verse 6, so that the accuracy of agreement in this one passage goes far towards proving that the law of which Amos speaks is identical with that which we now possess. In Amos 2 verses 11 and 12, he speaks of the Nazarites in conformity with the command in Numbers 6. In 3 verse 14, he mentions the horns of the altar, commanded to be made, Exodus 27 verse 2. Amos threatens, the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. But how is this a threat? What damage was likely to ensue because the ornaments of the altar were removed? To understand this it is necessary to remember, that, according to the Mosaic law, in order to effect an atonement for individuals or for the nation, it was necessary that the blood of the sacrifice should be put on the horns of the altar, as we find in Leviticus 4 verse 7, the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation and again, in Exodus 30 verse 10, Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. This one threat presupposes, that the people threatened were well acquainted with these ordinances, and valued them so highly as to think deprivation a punishment. These references may suffice to convince us that as these prophets are acquainted with the law of the Lord, a written law, called the book, and at the same time refer to the history and ordinances, to the periodic feasts generally, and the Feast of Tabernacles especially, to the new moons and Sabbaths, to the accurate distinction of the sacrifices into burnt offerings, sin offerings, and thank offerings, the nature of the animals required the tithes the distinction of clean and unclean food.
the Nazarites, the construction of the altar, the mode of atonement, etc. etc. and all this in the language of our present Pentateuch, the law of which they speak is the same as that known to us, even if there were no other records in the world but the Pentateuch and the writings of these prophets. But when we remember that the Pentateuch has been traced up to the days of Hezekiah, when these prophets exercised their ministry, and that besides there are historic books recording such a state of things as the Pentateuch must necessarily have produced, we can entertain no doubt as to the existence of that book in the days of these prophets, that is, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, king of Israel. See note. Note. The book of Joel would bring us to the days of Joash, king of Judah. But as there is much difference of opinion as to the time in which he prophesied, and as the four prophets bring us to the times of the kingdom of Israel, it is unnecessary to adduce his evidence. End of note. A book received in the days of those kings and by such men as these four prophets, so intimately acquainted with the history of their people, so bold in contending against error and sin, and so zealous for the truth, could not have been a forgery of their own days, nor of those immediately preceding. It must have been received of old as the law of the Lord. Indeed, the fact that in their days, and long before, there were two rival kingdoms, two rival priesthoods, and two different systems of worship, makes it impossible that any new system of law could have been imposed by either of the kingdoms on the other. The priests in Bethel were not likely to receive a new law branding themselves as impostors, and their worship as idolatry, nor were the kings of Israel more inclined to acknowledge a law, which, if firmly believed, must put an end to their royalty. As, therefore, the Pentateuch existed in the days of Uzziah and Jeroboam too, and could not have arisen during any period of the schism, it must also have existed in the days of Rehoboam and Solomon. And this conclusion is confirmed by the historical books. See note. A state of things is there described, just such as would have arisen from the knowledge of the Pentateuch, and allusions are made to certain portions of that book. Note. Though German critics reject all that is supernatural in the historical books and deny the authenticity of some passages of the narrative, they do not deny their general credibility. Thus Thenius says, concerning the books of Kings, the sections in the preceding paragraph under the rubric A2, as belonging to an extract from the history of the Kings, possess the fullest claim to credibility. Those referred to in AI, have a very slight tincture of the legendary but by far the greatest portion of the contents admits no doubts as to their historic character. Even those sections enumerated under B, I and 2 are certainly not devoid of a historical basis, and we have no reason whatever to doubt the truth of that which is remarked by the redactor himself introduction to his commentary to the Book of Kings, page 8. End of note.